Um, under the ceremonial items, which is item F on the agenda, we're on page two, uh, three ceremonial items and the subject. Mayor, but, um, yes. we're actually on item D1 first. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the appointment item. I, I don't know why I advanced on the, I'm, I apologize. I'm sorry, so we're on item D1. So page one of the agenda and the subject is a resolution to affirm the city's commitment to the seawall funding. For all those that are waiting to speak, I didn't do that on purpose. Recommendation that the city council adopt a resolution affirming the city of Oxnard's commitment to share the repair replacement costs associated with the Mandalay Bay seawalls in the amount of 50% of the total repair replacement cost. Oh, here we go, somebody, sorry. Sorry, all right. When it goes to the presentation, it covers the screen. Um, let's sorry see, about that. and that's okay. In the amount of 50% of the total repair replacement costs with the funding mechanism to be determined at a later date. This did go to the Public Works and Transportation uh, Committee. It was approved three to zero. And uh, we will start with the Public Works Director, Rosemary Gaglione, please. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, Rosemary Gaglione. Immediately following my presentation, there are members of the HOA who wish to speak. And so I will introduce their first speaker as soon as I'm done. So the, um, the recommendation, as the mayor said, was that the city council adopt a resolution affirming the cities of Oxnard's commitment to share the repair and replacement costs associated with the Mandalay Bay seawalls and the amount of 50% of the total repair and replacement costs with the funding mechanism to be determined at a later date. My eyes don't work that oh, well. Okay. <laughs> Between 1968 and 1973, the city of Oxnard approved the development of 743 attached and detached homes and 37 green belts to create the Mandalay Bay community. The developer installed reinforced concrete Boise and Zern style seawalls to create lots for residential development. Boise and Zern seawalls were constructed according to the building codes in place at that time, meaning that they were not uh, constructed according, uh, especially to our seismic standards today. Degradation in both types of walls began within the first 20 years due to the concrete's adverse reaction to the marine environment. Concrete doesn't like the chlorides in seawater. And so that's why we, when we do the new projects like the concrete jacketing of pilasters, we use a type two concrete, which is especially designed to be used in an ocean environment. The Mandalay Bay Waterways Assessment District was formed June 16, 1970 by Resolution 5144 to fund maintenance of the waterways and landscaping. Mandalay Bay residents are paying the maximum assessment based on the formation documents, which did not include a CPI escalator. That's a consumer price index. That's a convenient way of adjusting construction costs for inflation without doing complete new estimates. Due to the adoption of Prop 218 in 1996, the city is precluded from increasing assessments within the district without a majority vote and protest procedures, meaning we can't just drop in a new item. Over the past 30 plus years, hundreds of repairs have been done to the seawalls, including removal of degraded concrete, weep hole repairs, and concrete jacketing of pilasters. And the photo on the left are some freshly jacketed pilasters. In December of 2017, Trans Systems completed the Mandalay Bay Seawalls Capital Improvement Program Phase C, which included a recommendation of repairs to weep holes, pilasters, and walls. In early 2018, Public Works reviewed the accumulation of Trans Systems documents and determined a value engineering process was prudent in order to analyze the cost benefit options for seawall replacement. It's a best practice when you start to hit certain cost thresholds that you do value engineering. And the purpose is not to find fault with the design, but it's to make sure that it's being done in the most cost effective way and looking for ways to boost that benefit cost ratio. In October of 2018, the city released a request for a proposal for the Mandalay Bay repair feasibility study and phase two construction documents for 3900 to 3966 West Hemlock Street in March of 2019, TetraTech was awarded the contract and began work on the study, which included a cost analysis for each of the various wall replacement designs. TetraTech recommended two options, installation of panels and tiebacks or cantilever sheet pile. The tieback option would consist of installing a new panel in front of the existing wall and installing tiebacks that extend down into the competent non-liquefiable soils. 
cantilever sheet pile would consist of installing new sheet pile in front of the existing wall using a press-in method as opposed to vibratory or hammer uh, in order to have less vibration and noise and then filling the gap between the two walls. So this slide shows the tie back option. You have to go quite a ways out and quite a ways down to find that the non-liquefiable soil. And when you, at the end, there's actually concrete pumped in at the end to sort of create a bulb that would resist pull out. The cantilever sheet pile option, as you can see, is just a sheet pile that goes straight down in front of the wall. The issue is that with these walls, they have wooden piles and some of the piles are placed, they're, they're what are called battered. They are angled out toward the waterway. So we can't get too close without destroying these piles, which would maybe create a failure while we're trying to install new walls. So that means that we have to be at least eight feet out from these walls. And then we would fill the, the gap in with um, the appropriate material. The problem is most of the waterways are not wide enough to be able to lose that much real estate in the water and still function. Cost estimates range between $4,155 and $4,277 per linear foot for installation of the panel and tieback walls. The new seawalls would be constructed to withstand seismic activity and adhere to current California building code standards. The duration of the replacement project is estimated to be within 25 years with maintenance and minor repair activities beyond 25 years. The effective life of the new seawalls would be 75 years. Another option is a repair method similar to that proposed by Trans Systems. It would include removal of one to one and a half inches of existing concrete and the addition of four inches of marine resistant concrete doweled for improved adhesion, meaning we would drill into the existing walls, place dowels before we formed up the new walls. The difference between this and the trans systems option is that we wouldn't be wrapping them with a fiberglass sheet pile. Uh, we would be using the concrete instead. The concrete gives us visibility into what may be going on and uh, there aren't that many manufacturers of, of this fiberglass sheet pile material. So this would be a way to keep costs down. It would be non-structural to slow the deterioration. The effective life of repairs would be approximately 20 years. It may last longer, but 20 years is reasonable to assume. The seawalls would be monitored for any sign of movement. If they begin to move, then one of these replacement uh, options would be necessary. Stakeholders, including city staff, residents, and consultants have been meeting over the last three years to discuss replacement and funding options. Residents are working to engage their neighbors to form a bonded community facilities district or CFD to fund 50% of the obligation with the city funding the other 50%. The city will continue to pay 50% of ongoing repair costs as funds are available through the Mandalay Bay Waterways Assessment District. Through annual meetings, person-to-person -person coordination and engagement, consultants will work to survey registered voters on approval of the CFD. Approval of this resolution affirms the city council's commitment to fund 50% of the seawall replacement costs. Overall estimates from the project for the project are approximately 200 million adjusted for inflation, 100 of which would be borne by the city. Funds will be allocated when a funding method is determined. That concludes my presentation. And Mr. Mayor, would you, like, would you like to ask any questions of me first or would you like me to bring Debbie Mitchell on at this time? I think Debbie Mitchell will go with her first, please. Can, we ask, a, can we ask a technical question first, Mayor, please? Um, actually, if there's, if there's a clarification, Councilman Prello, one of the things we wanna make sure we do because we do have a number of speakers, um, one of the things we want to make sure we do is stay if the, within the council members realm of question asking. So is there something that was just yes. presented that you're not clear about? Yes. And I want the public to totally understand. Ms. Gaglion, can you yeah. please explain that there would not be enough distance if we separated the wall by adding, turning the area that we would lose and the why it's because of the boats being able to turn? Y yes. So when, when we, so when we look at, uh, putting a sheet, the cantilever sheet pile, we need eight to 10 feet between the existing wall and the new wall. That's eight to 10 feet lost, plus it's two to three feet in width for the sheet pile. And so you're effectively taking 12, 13 feet from either side of a waterway. Some of these waterways then would be so narrow that, yeah, it wouldn't be convenient to have a dock. Uh, if, if people on both sides want to have a dock and a boat and be able to move it all, that, that probably wouldn't happen. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I think it helps the public. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, now, De De oh, go ahead. So Debbie Mitchell is waiting in the wings to present for the HOA. Thank you. Debbie Mitchell, please. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for hearing us. My name is Debbie Mitchell. I'm vice president of Channel Islands Waterfront Homeowners Association, representing over 743 homeowners in Mandalay Bay, also known as Special District Waterways One. At the Public Works and Transportation meeting on 72820, we objected to the concept of tying the 50 50 split to the formation of a CFD because that would have placed us in a position of potentially changing nothing for years in the event of turnover within the city staff or additional unforeseen circumstances like those we've seen for decades. I want to begin by acknowledging the financial condition of the city, the county, the state, the country, and to commend council and staff on an amazing job through this most challenging time. I intend to give you background on Mandalay that is not a part of the staff report to give you a broader view from homeowners and residents perspectives that there have been many meeting with the city for decades through staff and council turnovers through economic swings in all directions, although 2020 does win for extremes. Next slide, please. The city owns the seawalls. There are many homeowners who feel that the city owns the seawalls and that therefore they are responsible for them. There are many homeowners that feel if the city is incapable of footing the expense and the needs for work on the seawalls, that the city should first take the responsibility for ignoring decades of doing nothing about addressing the problem and approach the homeowners with a plan for partnership that both mitigates the expense of the delay and exhibits a working relationship based on transparency and a voice at the table. This is a huge capital improvement project and the funding and planning delays have exponentially multiplied the current investment requirement. Next slide. The assessment district was formed in 1972. The original documents stated that the city would levy a special assessment each year, each tax year to pay for such expenses and portions of which that must be paid by the district. So if they never increased the assessment, they must be approving a sufficient levy. Next slide, please. So that you understand the reticence of the homeowners, when they look at the waterways and they look at the assessment, in 1972, the assessment was increased between 1972 and 1978, according to needs. This assessment more than doubled again by 1986 to pay for dredging. This assessment more than doubled again by 1993. Landscaping, water quality, dredging, all of the seawall maintenance all comes out of this one assessment. Next slide. In 1978, California's famous Proposition 13 limited property tax to 1% of each parcel's assessed value. The limited increases in assessed value and required that, that local special taxes be approved by a two thirds vote of the electorate. So cities began creating special assessments around Prop 13 funding for funding leading to the passage of Prop 218 in 1966. Now, realizing that this was formed in 1972, those Prop 13 and Prop 218 were in play on the original documents, nothing changed. Although billed as an effort to restore Prop 13, Prop 218 required additional notice to property owners by first class mail. It changed the majority protest requirement to something approximating an election. All property owners subject to assessment increases must be sent ballots. Their votes weighted in, pro in proportion to the share of the total assessment each would pay. The assessment must be approved by a majority vote cast or the proceedings must be dropped. Waterways maintenance district assessments have not increased since 1993. Next slide. Although the assessment has not increased since 1993, costs have increased, awareness has increased. Many things have been done 
1998, Harbor Offshore con conducted a study and identified priority needs. Consultants from Noble Engineering were brought in. In 1999, there was a depth survey expenditure of 300,000 for water quality and drain issues that were identified. In 2000, the city was putting finishing touches on a newly installed repair and maintenance database to, to improve the overall monitoring of the seawall conditions and to provide instant access to everyone, every lot's condition, repair status, historical repairs. I have no idea where that went. Um, at that time, we had an operations manager, Jim Weeks, who had been very helpful, but he left in August 2000. That began our turnover of, of fundamental staff people that had been very, very useful to working with the, the HOA. Next slide. Between 96 and 2006, 6 6.2 million were spent on repairs. That money accumulated in our fund and, and was then spent later. So even though that sounds like a lot of money, it was collected over years on deferred maintenance. Seawall repairs estimated for a cost for the next 15 years was 13248000 which of course we didn't have because we just spent it all. In addition to, to that, the 2006 funding needs were estimated to be $1.5 million for dredging, and 300 to 350,000 for guardrail replacements. Uh, that dredging has not taken place and, I, and you know, so we didn't have the funds for that. Next slide, please. Water quality issues were a big issue in 2006. It was determined that something should be done about the Oxnard drain, which dumps over 2000 acres of storm drain runoff into Mandalay Bay, just north of Channel Islands Bridge. As you know, water quality is still an issue. This was never resolved. Next slide, please. A task force had been formed. This is a picture of the muck from the drain. Needless to say, staff turnover and, and, and brick walls left this issue unresolved in the long run. Next slide, please. In 2006, it was estimated that it would take 53 years at the current assessment rates to complete the seawall repairs that had been identified. Next slide. The city recommended in 2006 that we double our assessment or go for a bond. This is a slide from the 2006 meeting. Next slide, please. The seawall team worked with the city and drafted plans in 2008 and 2009 based on that 2006 move that we should double our assessment. The goal was to establish a contract between the city and homeowners and share the cost and oversight of seawalls and dredging on a 50-50 basis. One of the longstanding arguments was that the city owns the seawalls like, and like streets, they need to maintain them. Of course, CFDs have been formed in other areas to mitigate the costs because the city simply cannot afford based on the tax decreases or limits that have been set by some of the uh, earlier laws. In a VC Star article about the seawalls in 2012, um, Mayor Holden said, discussions have evolved. The city and homeowners have shaped an option fair to both. <clears throat> that never happened. The article went on to say that that Councilman Tim Flynn, who with Holden has worked closely with the Seawall Committee, knows some residents waiting for pothole fixes in their neighborhoods and streets and will wonder how the expense could be justified. Oxnard at that time already was about 1 million short of what was needed to fix its streets and alleyways, he said. It does place a hardship on the city, adding to the costs of the seawall. Next slide, please. Between 2003 and 2014, there were many, many funds spent on plans for dredging, guardrail replacement, uh, slope protection, a huge project on Kingsbridge Way. Next slide, please. A good portion was spent on engineering design and monitoring through 2014. Next slide, please. So remember that formation document. Council said, council shall decide whether or not the cost shall be borne wholly or partially by said maintenance district. City council shall level, levy a special assessment tax each year sufficient to pay such expenses and the portion thereof which must be paid by the district. Next slide. 
This is the most recent resolution fixing the assessment for Waterways 1. Whereas assessments were levied in the district fiscal year 2019-2020 and such assessments are not proposed to increase in fiscal year 2021, the engineering studies <clears throat> have numbers that have clearly indicated for dec decades a need to fund this project. They have clearly stated that the budget is inadequate. Every city manager and every mayor, every public works director we have met with over the years agreed this need needed to be addressed. Next slide, please. Yet every year a budget is passed with the same inadequate numbers. Next slide, please. Total budget requirements, 492,207. Yet the numbers tell a different story and we have been through more value engineering and more feasibility studies. Granted, the new studies take in seismic resilience, which is very important and was not at all a consideration when these seawalls <clears throat> were built. In 2019, budget appropriations in the amount of 163,431 from the fund balance to establish a budget for engineering services and seawall repair. In 2019, TetraTAC did a study for documentation for West Hemlock. You'll be hearing later about a te the TetraTAC Tetra Tetra contract. There have been so many expenses, and this is, this is to make the point that work is being done. This is being looked at. The funds are still inadequate, and the prices continue to go up. Next slide. Our HOA has been meeting with the city for decades regarding the resources needed to address seawalls, water quality, dredging, landscaping, and methods for, for a, and processes for increasing funding. We haven't had any real numbers to work with and those won't be completed even on this feasibility study until the final geological test is done. And that's a, a later item on the agenda in the regular meeting. At no time in all of those meetings for all of those years were the homeowners unwilling or resist resistant to discuss ways to increase the waterways one assessment. Next slide. We know this is a very fragile time for Oxnard. We are most grateful to be heard and even more so to see this agendized. Neither the city nor the homeowners have funds available to fix this. this the, we must. We are hoping that this is a turning point. We have been heard. We hope for your approval. It has never been a good time, but it will never be a better time. In reality, the cost impact, next slide, of this 50-50 split will be self-limited by the least common denominator. If the waterways district is unable to develop a new assessment district or a CFD for the 50-50, it will be limited to the amount present in the current waterways district. If the amount available in waterways is greater than the amount available in city funding, the work must be limited by the amount available from the city. This vote would show good faith and protect the waterways district one and the city from Groundhog Day in the event the fiscal impact of the pandemic and other issues that are draining resources prevent a timely formation of a funding mechanism. And it could prevent an unintended consequence should we have an earthquake or there be problems that we're currently unaware of. Next slide, please. The harbor is open to all. The channels provide a socially distance appropriate recreational space for kayakers, paddle boards, and boaters. And Waterways One is a thoroughfare between Westport and Seabridge on the north and the rest of the Channel Islands Harbor on the south. The city has been on the path of correcting the mistakes of the past. We know this is not an easy sell. This is not a convenient time. It never was, it never will be, but we surely hope that you will approve this. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And I do have a number of speakers that have signed up to speak and I want to be able to call on them first. Oh, we have panelists. I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, yeah, there were additional speakers from the from the HOA. Um, and I wonder if we could call those in order. They're on the Zoom meeting. Um, Pat Yaunas, Connie Hege, Carol Taylor, and then Bill Clark. 
Well, okay. Um, okay, well, what I'd like to do is, okay, so um, the panelists are Bill Clark. Tell me again, Connie Hege. Uh, Carol Taylor and Pat Yonas. And Pat Yonas. Okay, why don't we start with Bill Clark, please? I think he may be late getting to the meeting if he's not on because okay. he was working. Okay, why don't we start with Carol Taylor then? Okay. Please. Good evening. And Yes, and Miss Taylor, could you? Um, we're unfortunately we're in a in a, a little bit of a time crunch. Um, how much time do you need? About two minutes. That's wonderful. Go ahead, proceed, please. Okay. Good evening. Uh, we've demonstrated that the city owns the seawalls. Therefore, the city's responsibility and obligation to maintain, repair, or possibly replace the seawalls is needed. Historically, homeowners of Mandalay Bay have paid a portion of seawall repairs through their waterway assessment district. The district generates approximately $492,000 per year. However, please keep in mind that the water assessment district is not limited to seawalls. A sampling of some of the other items paid from the district are landscaping, utilities, water quality, city staff and consulting, uh, dredging if, if ever that happens, with landscaping consuming approximately $310,000 per year of the approximate $492,000 generated. The cost of a major seawall overhaul or replacement is significant. Neither the city nor the homeowners have adequate funds for such a project. Per the director's estimates of the lowest cost of $4,155 per linear foot, a homeowner with a 40 foot lot would have a cost of $166,200. I mean, in, in order to finance such a project, a bond would be required. Per NBS, in order to obtain a bond, a minimum 50% commitment is required by the city. Tonight's vote is simply the preliminary step required towards that goal of obtaining a bond. That's it. When, after that, the homeowners would then vote on an increase to the current assessment district or create a new assessment district geared specifically to funding seawalls voted on by homeowners or create a new CFD voted on by residents specific to seawalls. The scope of an assessment district versus a capital funding district has yet to be adequately explored. But at that time, the value of public versus private benefit will be calculated with corresponding proportionate allocation shared by both homeowners and the city. The city needs to commit to the partnership with the homeowners to work, work towards creating an effective and viable funding mechanism and move forward with its responsibilities to adequately monitor, maintain, repair, and possibly replace aging seawalls. Ongoing delays and procrastinations are not an acceptable strategy. The vote must happen in order to move forward with the preliminary steps for the partnership in obtaining a bond and the city's obligation to meet the needs of the aging seawalls. I sometimes joke that um, the channels are really the alleys behind our homes. So anyhow, we need your help on this and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is, is Connie Kiki, please. Mayor, I think she was having some trouble joining. Um, I did oh, resend okay. her the oh. link, but if you wanna move on to a different speaker. Yes, um, and Bill Clark, is he present? Bill Clark is not present. Carol Taylor just spoke. Connie Higgy's having problems. Um, and the last, um, and uh, let's see, uh, per, let's see, Jim Cowell, was he also, uh, Ms. Mitchell, was Jim Cowell on the panel? Uh, Bill Clark just joined. Okay, how about if we go with Bill Clark? Dr. Clark, please. He needs to unmute. Mayor, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, Mayor, City Council Mayor, my name is Bill Clark, and I'm the president of the Channel Islands Homeowners Association. I come before you tonight to support the resolution to evenly divide the cost of the seawall repair and replacement between the city and the homeowners. As you are well aware, the Homeowners Association and the city has been working on this issue for almost 20 years. This resolution is a major step in the right direction towards a final solution to this longstanding problem. Unfortunately, ever since the state of California changed the laws that governed the fundings of assessment districts in the early 1990s, none of the leaders before us have been willing to address the funding of the seawall repairs. This is not a popular subject, but one that needs stout leadership to bring about a final resolution. 
The degradation of the seawalls does not stop for pandemics, elections, or economic downturns. A healthy, vibrant harbor is important to the reputation and economic future of all of Oxnard. While the city took over ownership of the seawalls soon after the development was completed in the early 1970s, the homeowners have always understood that we need to be active participants in assuring that together we maintain the integrity of the walls. The passage of this resolution will empower the homeowners association to go before the homeowners to prove to them the city council understands the problem, the council understands the responsibility, and the council is a willing, pro willing partner in this project. Without this resolution, it will be almost impossible for us to get the homeowner's approval for a new assessment district to fund the repairs. While there are those who would argue that the homeowners are the primary beneficiaries of this project, it is ultimately the city of Oxnard who is responsible for these seawalls. The city of Oxnard owns the seawalls and it's up to the city of Oxnard to maintain them. The seawalls do not just hold back dirt, they support homes and they support decks. People live in those homes, children's play, children play on those decks. A collapse of the seawall could lead to a serious injury and worst case, someone's death. A collapse of a portion of the seawalls will not only compromise the adjacent homes, but will lead to a loss of property values throughout the harbor. The city has been warned by multiple consultants that the concrete within the seawalls has significantly degraded and without repairs, they will collapse. Over the last two decades, the Homeowner Association has worked with this issue with multiple city councils, multiple city staff, and multiple city managers. It has taken far too long to get to this point. It would be a shame to miss this opportunity to finally bring, bring resolution to this long-standing problem. I urge you to vote in favor of this resolution. Thank you for your time and thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. And we'll go back to Connie Hege, please. Connie Hege? She's still not with us. Okay, and Ms. Mitchell, um, uh, who, are there any remaining panel members? Otherwise, I'll go just in the list of speakers. You could call uh, on Patricia Yanis. Patricia Yanis, please. Patricia Yanis. Okay, why don't we go then we're just, with- we're I'm just here. Her to unmute, there she goes. Oh, okay, there we go. Thank you. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, Mr. Noonan, staff members, and members of the public. My name is Patricia Eunice, and my husband and I are residents of Mandalay Bay. I'm here to give some lingering thoughts that many people may have. The short and the sweet, the bottom line of who owns the seawall, the seawalls. The city owns the seawalls, just like it owns the public parks and the streets. As we all know, over the last 18 or so years, the city has vacillated on seawall ownership. It seems that like to us that when it was beneficial to the city, it owned the seawall, but when it was not beneficial, the seawalls belonged to property owners. There have been lawyers and lawsuits over this, but in truth, it's all very, very simple. Anyone can go to the county surveyor's office and pull up the track maps for Mandalay Bay. There are six of them. Track maps are the plans created by a developer who is proposing a project on or development on raw land. They show what is to be built and where. They show the public areas and they show the private areas. Track maps are created in two tiers, tentative and final. They take a long time to process and have tremendous scrutiny. They are processed through the city and in certain cases through the county. When completed, they are signed as approved by the developer, the registered engineer who created the map. And guess what? There's no self, <laughs> you can't self process these. Um, the county tax collector and the treasurer, the city tax collector and treasurer, the city engineer, and then the city planning commission and ultimately the city Council, every single entity through this process, and which has an opportunity to sign on these track maps, has the opportunity to review, question, study, and deny any part of the map as it is processed. There's, all, there's also one very important part of the track map that many people don't know about. This is called the owner's certificate. It's printed right onto the map. 
Among other statements, the owner certificate states specifically the areas to be de dedicated for public use, i.e. the city. Public reuse means those areas will become assets to the city upon completion. In the case of Mandalay Bay, these are clearly identified as the streets, the parks, the roads, the, and the channels. Interestingly and importantly included on the owner's certificates on each Mandalay Bay track map is a statement regarding easements over the public area channels given to every property owner adjacent to that um, area to construct docks, gangways, and decks. In every case, the city council in writing accepted these track maps as described and dedicated, thereby accepting the streets and the parks and the parking areas and the seawalls and the water in the channels. By its own hand, the city of Oxnard accepted the developer's dedication to the city of Oxnard, Oxnard the city and channels within Mandalay Bay. And this is where we are today. It is truly, they are truly the city's asset, but the homeowners are anxious to participate. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Vote yes. Thank you very much. Okay, um, why don't we go to the top of the list and just make sure I get- um, to So we have Connie Hagee on now. Connie is now on, okay, Connie. Great, thank you so much and apologize for the technical challenges here. Um, first, I, I wanna thank you for your review and consideration of the resolution to affirm the city's commitment to seawall funding, which I encourage you to approve. However, I would like to bring a few concerns to your attention regarding statements made in the document D1. Um, first of all, on pages eight, nine, and 11, the document states that city staff and others have been meeting with residents from Channel Islands HOA over the last three years to discuss funding methodologies for the repair and replacement of the seawalls. Representatives from the HOA board, the HOA communications team, and the seawall committee have met with the city. However, um, on the, these discussions, at least in my opinion, were more in the format of a focus group rather than a meeting where the city representatives presented unvetted solutions and unrealistic financing options. All of the information was in draft form with many unknowns and nothing was presented in a form that could be shared with other residents. Page 11, the committee outcomes section states the public works and Transportation Committee voted 3-0 on July 28th to approve the staff recommendations with one change, which was striking the CFD formation requirement. However, the reference to forming a CFD continues to be stated twice on page 75. These references need to be revised, I think. Page 12 in the Finance Impact section I'm wondering what is intended by the word final in the following sentence, which is, while approval of this resolution affirms the city council's commitment to 50% of the final seawall obligations, there is no immediate financial impact. So I wasn't sure what was meant by the word final there. Also on page 12 in the financial impact section, there's a sentence that states, Public Works continues to seek grant funding to offset the city's financial no. obligation to the seawall replacements. If grants are obtained, these funds should offset the total cost with the remaining expenses divided appropriately between the city and the residents, not just the city's financial obligation. Next, the sections in the document that describe the tieback method for seawall replacement do not provide information as to how much space will be lost in the channels for this method. It is stated that eight feet per wall would be lost using the cantilever method, but no information of the loss is covered for the tieback method. And then lastly, the overall cost is very expensive, even with the lesser expensive tieback method. 
Are there other options that we should investigate and consider before making a final decision here? So thank you. And if you need a written copy of any of these concerns, I'd be happy to provide that. Please do, please do. Thank you very much. And why don't we go to the top of the list, James Aragon, please. Hi, James, you have three minutes to speak on the seawalls item beginning now. Thank you, everyone. I hope you're having a great week. First, we say that the city does have an obligation to fix these seawalls just through virtue of contract law. Um, I was very fortunate to speak with two homeowners in the district prior to this meeting, um, and they did have good things to say about the current public work staff and the city manager's leadership and uh, seeking resolution. Um, this is the first time in decades that the progress is being made in positive light and that's a positive light to shine on leadership. Uh, this is an annoying topic though. The city leaders have all likely moved on to the afterlife, made decisions that could very well result in my future grandchildren paying taxes to resolve. My oldest child is just 16. Uh, this is the shadow of government. We're making decisions that other people will have to pay the consequences for uh, when they are long gone. It is also remarkable that this outgoing body is considered making a promise to spend $100 million to benefit what many would consider an elite neighborhood two weeks after begging Oxnard families to spend more tax on school supplies, clothing, hygiene, and other necessities. But this is where we are, and there is an obligation here. Uh, the city should never have signed up to own seawalls that benefit a specific neighborhood and above and beyond what other neighborhoods enjoy. But it did, and now the city has an obligation. When the home homeowners made the decision to buy, they would have been under the impression that the city would take care of its contractual responsibilities. And it's actually fortunate that the homeowners are willing to pay for half. Otherwise, the city would actually have a massive liability twice the size of $100 million. And it is the city's liability. The city needs to take care of this current liability, but also look beyond the immediate 25 years proposed to replace uh, these walls. As emphasized during my opposition to Measure E, this is another example of mismanagement around predictable capital needs. This body is not responsible for the 45 years of mismanagement, but now it needs to take a, make a thoughtful decision that, goes, that does not strap our great-great-great-grandchildren with future failing seawalls in the years to come after 2100. We have to do things that look that far forward. It's unfair not to. There's a value in this neighborhood to the city of Oxnard, and it's not kayaking or postcards. By the way, I do kayak through their alleys. The residents have shown themselves to be friendly and it's enjoyable to do so. But the number of people who partake in this is limited given the cost of renting and owning a kayak or paddleboard. But any capital investments that do not benefit seconds. the entire of this, this city should normally be undertaken. Everyone benefits from sewer infrastructure, water infrastructure, roads and firehouse routes. But if spending taxpayer money on a particular project, the net benefits to the city needs to be assessed. I'd like to see a financial assessment on tax receipt, future, present value of future tax receipts in light of future costs. Not just the cost of now, but I'm talking about $800 million to replace seawalls in 2100. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And the last speaker is Jim Cowell, please. Taking this is limited Hi, Jim. Um, if you could please turn Hi. down in the Hi. background, and you have three minutes sure. to speak on the seawalls item. Please begin now. Okay, thank you for the time. My name is Jim Cowell. I'm a homeowner in the Mandalay Bay uh, Harbor. And uh, I think we've heard tonight that rebuilding the walls is certainly fraught with frustration due to the delays and changes in city staff. Um, but we've also heard that it's something that needs to be done as we move forward. 
I think this uh, proposal for financing is key to making progress on something, a problem that's been admired for quite a long time. Although the, the amount of money required to recapitalize the walls is considerable, I think it's important to keep in mind that the cost of not recapitalizing the walls, not rebuilding the walls, is actually greater, especially should a failure occur. And by a failure, what I'm talking about is a collapse of the seawall that could be uh, uh, predicated or caused by an earthquake. I also want to want to um, point out that the the study that was done by Tetra Tech looked at a wide array of options, and uh, I spent a lot of time reviewing that study. The two that the Public Works Director presented are the two options that that floated to the top, and we're going to hear more about those with an item later on the agenda. I think the city action today is especially positive. Uh, it is appreciated, and I encourage you to pass it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, before we take any council comments, I just, uh, city manager would like to make a few comments. Mr. City Manager, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, obviously, with the long history that Ms. Mitchell provided um, at the beginning of the um, public comments uh, sh should be more than enough for us to understand the context uh, mixed with the frustration and the realities. As to um, one of the public speakers discussing uh, bad decision-making in the past, uh, what I have to say about that is it's really difficult to go back that far and understand what the set of circumstances were back then. Uh, also what the codes were uh, relative to seismic safety. Obviously they weren't um, uh, existent back that far. Uh, so no one has a crystal ball when they're making these sorts of decisions. So I think what we're confronted with today is, is, is what it is and we just need to move forward. Um, in terms of, of the, the expense and, and the cost going into the out years, that actually makes sense when you're looking at a capital um, project such as this. It should be paid for across generations into the future because they're the ones who will also be benef uh, benefiting from, from the expense that we incur today in order to make these kind of fixes. So whether it's the seawalls or or roads or bridges or tunnels, all these things should be paid for uh, cross-generational, multi-generationally, shouldn't be uh, burdened by the, the, the only the generation of the present. And then finally, I just wanna say that um, I insisted on having this item come before the council for formal, formal action because in the time that I've been here, I've heard both from the residents and from some city staff that my predecessor um, made this commitment uh, publicly. And my only concern with that is as a city manager, uh, you don't have the authority to make the commitment. You only have the authority to commit that you will recommend it to the city council, which is what I am doing tonight. But it is important uh, in my opinion, which is why we're making the recommendation, is to make this commitment formal so that we can actually proceed and get on to the business of fixing the seawalls. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, what I'd like to do, uh, just to let the council know, we have seven minutes to uh, go to the regular part of the meeting. And uh, I don't see any hands raised here. Uh, Mr. Uh, Councilman Perello, uh, you're the the chairman of this public works committee, I'll just ask you to make any comments that you would like to make. First off, um, as distasteful as the price is, this has to be done, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the speakers have mentioned it, the city manager mentioned it. Um, I wanna thank publicly, I wanna thank the Channel Islands Homeowners Association that's been speaking up, Mitchell, Taylor, Clark, Giannis, and Hagee. Um, and again, Hagee, please, the notes that you have, please share them with the council and the city. This is something that uh, in the past, we didn't know about the earthquake. We didn't know about the rules at the road. We can go back and look, but you have to deal with the here and now. And the here and now are, this needs to be addressed. And this is the best that we have at the present time. And I would, if no other comments, I would make the motion to support this. 
I have a comment. Here, Pro Tem. Thank you. Just very quickly, I want to thank uh, the homeowners for their uh, patience and cooperation and thank the city manager for uh, uh, fashioning this uh, proposal, this agreement. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned here for future uh, council people everywhere. Um, we didn't know what we didn't know apparently back when. I consider the city an organic whole and I know that people are going to say what we just heard a little bit of, why this particular area of the city getting the attention, but when one part of the city doesn't get the attention, everybody ultimately suffers because of our obligations. So I totally support this. Um, and I think we have to try to make it work before um, much more time passes. So I will, I'll, I'll do the second, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further comments by members of the council? So I'd just like to make a concluding remark before we take our, our vote here and um, do that so publicly. Uh, I've been involved in this issue since I was first elected to the city council in 2004. And I'll say that there was a common denominator from 2004 until 2020, money and large amounts of money. And the reason why this was not acted on earlier um, is because of the money. Um, and I would just say that um, it goes back even further than the last city manager making a commitment. Um, there was tacit commitments made by previous members of the city council without me being specific about a 50-50 split, uh, which was advocated actually by, I believe, the homeowners group from the very inception of this. I think this is a, a fair compromise. Uh, it is a difficult pill to swallow, not only for the city, but uh, certainly for the homeowners. And so I just want to commend the city manager for finally bringing it forward. Um, and uh, I, I ask that it be brought forward first to the committee. It was brought forward to the committee. And uh, now we're taking that final vote tonight. So um, um, let's go ahead and take the vote. Madam City Clerk, we have a motion by Councilman, I mean, uh, Committee Chair and Councilman Prello and a uh, uh, second by Mayor Pro Tem Ramirez. Mayor Pro Tem Ramirez. Yes. Councilwoman Basua. Yes. Councilmember Prello. Yes. Councilmember Mondragal. Yes. Mayor Flynn. Aye. Councilman McDonald. Aye. Councilmember Lopez. Yes. The motion carries seven to zero. Very well. So um, it's excellent that we're on time. Uh, I will have an announcement uh, because of the amount of speakers and the agenda, the size of the agenda. At Once the meeting starts, we have three minutes. We'll take a three-minute break until um, 6 p.m., please. <laughs> 